kind of the role you were just on, it brought up the question that I've had is, um, how, could, how would you advise a person, a guild, a community to recognize whether they need to get in touch with humility or hubris? <laughs> how to be how to be humble and brave at the same time? Please. Yeah. Um, um, by noticing positive feedback, by noticing when you see these, when you do get these emergent properties of complexity in your face, it really cheers you up. It seriously cheers you up. So go ahead, make messes, but pay attention. And, I mean, Arnie Ness, the deep ecologist, he's, he's flat out about that. He says, pay attention, but don't buy it. So that's the humility kind of. And you, you had brought up Alan Savory in the beginning. I think that story, hearing that before I ever got involved in permaculture or any other work, was terrifying. Terrifying. I mean, it's, so thinking, because we were, we were working, all three of us actually were with Audubon Canyon talking about doing the burns, some of this more large-scale stuff, and that concept of, like, are we sure this is going to do, or are we going to desertify the whole landscape, right? And checking in with all of those different factors. Yeah, I'm a little, I'm a little wary of this Trex training, and the and the scale that's being attempted. And instead, I'm a follower of Dennis Martinez, and um, and he's my mentor. Um, and so I always recommend that local people first learn to do cool burning. That's why I keep saying cultural burning. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there are indigenous people, the Yurok, especially on the North Coast, who are, uh, who are recommending really hot burns and, and, and generally perimeter, perimeter lighting, <coughs> central, central burning. And I have some questions about that. I don't think it's uh, useful as a blanket prescription. Um, so everything site-specific. But in general, if you can prepare an area enough with enough fuel on the ground to get fire to move downhill at low intensity, um, you're going to have a lot more survival of, uh, of uh, soil biodiversity. Um, you'll scarify some na native seeds. I'm really intrigued with what is called the soil seed bank. So there's a bunch of stuff on any site, including under eucalyptus, that's just dormant, it's just sitting there. And under the right conditions of light, he, you know, opening up, mess, making messes, disturbance regimes, you can have some emergent plants that'll blow your mind and you wonder how they got there. So, so there's some kind of clues in that, but, they, but to first, when people come to the social forestry course, they all want to burn. They're like, we got to burn. They're like, can we burn this year? Are we going to be able to burn? So, you know, I'm like, yeah, okay, let's do some pile burning. And okay, let's make some, some uh, small batch charcoal. And then, and then inevitably, the fire gets away. And, and the Sawyers, maybe, or other people are like, oh, oh we got to control that. And I go, eh. And so I have to, like, change people's relationship to fire. And I almost want to have them do it naked. Um, I want them to lose their fear of really blowing it, you know, of, of really making a big mess that can't be fixed, right? I, so, so I work them up, you know. Like, Okay, let it go. Just see what happens. The next thing I do is I say, oh, I have, I call it guardian oak, Rus, Rus diversa loba, also known as poison oak, but I call it guardian oak. I also call it lacquer bush because it's the very best black lacquer. You learn how to use it. It's the best. It's so valuable. So we shouldn't be, de we shouldn't be mean to it by calling it poison oak, you know. Protector That's oak. Oh, Protector sorry. oak, guardian oak, okay? Yeah. There's a bunch of words we can use to be more polite. Uh, I, next thing I do is have them burn, burn have them burn, under burn. I take them to this one area and say, this is my best berry patch. And 
for overwinter birds, that would be the Buick's wren, the thrush. Um, oh God, what's the third one? Can't remember right now. But um, these are very important uh, over yeah, hermit thrush. Um, these are the very important overwintering birds, and they depend on guardian war, uh, oak berries over winter, which are persistent on the thing. So, so I tell them this whole story, and they're scared to death both of fire and of guardian oak. And I'm like, no, I want you to burn this. And well, how do we protect ourselves, you know, and, and stuff like, well, here's how you do it. And, and um, I have some homeopathic pills if you need some magic. And uh, I, can, I can hypnotize you if you want me to. And, um, and, and I give them all the reasons. And it blows their minds. Just doing a little something. And having everybody participate in, doing, in making little messes um, is a really good way to, to get people to settle down a little bit and consider doing something bigger. So stage it. That's what I mean by staging. You know. Sequence. Sequence. Sequence comes out of, of council. And in Oregon, the governor, Kitzhopper, supported local watershed councils. And in different parts of Oregon, there have been water, I mean, of California, Northern California, there have been watershed councils. And I always refer to Planet Drum and the Peters, okay? Because they, they pretty much got bioregional thinking going in Northern California. And I was one of the presenters at the bioregional conference in Mount Shasta decades ago. Um, so um, uh, the maps, I think, are hidden in some old farts closets. And we just need to find those map stashes because a whole bunch of work has been done. And right now, our political boundaries are nonsensical. They're unbiological. They're unecological. So if we start thinking, and by the way, in the rest of the world, a watershed is only the ridgeline. It's the peak of your roof. It's a drainage basin, a basin. And thinking in terms of basins is very powerful storytelling. And in fact, it's used in mathematics and stuff like, um, and in advanced astrophysics, basins, shapes. And ultimately, the shape of your drainage basin is going to teach you the stories of place. You are going, any, any culture that becomes a culture of place is going to learn from the place what the stories are. And then every time they look at their place, they are going to see the stories. The stories will be there in front of them. And basically, Earth is a woman. It's obvious. It's really clear. Every place you look, you're going to see mama. So the trickster myths, the, you know, the origin myths, the sky woman myths, all these myths, all have to do with the shape of things. This is really, this is where we need elders and storytellers and, and pilgrimage walks and and wisdom that, that starts to accumulate first in a fragmentary form and then starts to fit together. And we start to have a repertoire and we're able to orient, in other words, bring new people into community, community with place. But that place relationship, I think is really essential. I, I, like, I like the book Kreft, um, what's his name? Got it. Getting it right now, uh, not McFarland. Yeah, close. Oh damn, I remember. It. Um, yeah. So he was. He's an archaeologist in in Wales in England. K R A. C A E R F T. Craft. Okay, and craft is what we do with what we have 
in place. Okay, so craft is what we do with what we have in place. And that is how we live and how we celebrate our lives. And this gets really interesting. You know, like, what are we eating? How do we do medicine? What's our relationship to each other? Uh, what do our dreams mean? Um, all this kind of starts to come together. And when it does all to come together, you become a people of place. I, I've, I've recently stumbled on a Canadian woman, uh, Christy Harris. I think I've got that right. Christy Harris. And the book that's still in print is called The Mouse Woman Trilogy. And this is the Haida people in the Queen Charlotte Islands in, in Vancouver, up in, up in uh, the Johnson Straits. And the Haida were the Japanese of the North American um, Northwest. And, um, and she was able to take stories that were collected by the anthropologist Boaz, which has all the patriarchy problems and there's a lot. Anthropologists love to tear this guy down. It's mm -hmm. just a, it's a, it's a, it's a game. And, um, but he collected a bunch of stories in native language from various tribes in that area. And Christy Harris has translated those stories into young adult books. But I'm telling you, these are sophisticated. And Mouse Woman is the tiniest grandmother with the biggest attitude. And she specializes in rescuing young people who have gotten in trouble through no fault of their own. That's her specialty. And by, lear by learning these stories about mouse women, you learn about etiquettes and taboos. And it reinforces. And it builds and so she just happened to capture a thread like I'm claiming from my own people from about the same time, same time period here, 1700s to now, and has gifted us with them. And she's long gone now. But there's, I think I've now really gone on a binge because a lot of her books are out of print and I probably have 12 of her books. And I have, I have six grandchildren in Ashland and one grandchild in, in is El, Cerrito. El Cerrito, across the street, therefore it's El Cerrito. Okay, um, so I'm making sure these books are available to my grandchildren because they're really, really, they're the best example I've found that's digestible, that carries that stuff. And oh my gosh, am I looking for a Korean folk tale about White Oak, the White Oak Princess. I'm really looking for that. I'm hoping there's a Japanese story about that. There's Lithuanian stories. There are Lithuanian stories. Yeah. And there's there's um, Robert Graves, the White Goddess. Um, so I've, I know the European stories. So we can put that all together. And um, it, there's also a really good article that's in my bibliography uh, called The People of the Hazel. So, um, with the retreat of the ice sheet in Northern Europe, which was very rapid, if you know your geology, the retreat of the last ice age was astounding. It was so fast. Giant floods. You know, the myth of Noah's flood and everything come out of the retreat of those glaciers. Well, these glaciers retreated, leaving basically moss lands, and then recent uh, uh, palynology, which is the study of pollen grains. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you can go to what are called driftless areas where the glaciers didn't scrape everything and you can find bogs in those driftless areas and you can do cores and you can see how fast the ecosystem changed. Well, for some reason, Hazel, moves fast, boom, Scandinavia. It's like, wait a minute, 
that's not natural. Damn right. And, um, and so right after Hazel comes all these other food forest species. And it's fast, really fast. So all of Northern Europe was food forested in less than a thousand years. <laughs> Bang! And the scientists are looking at this evidence and they're going, hmm, maybe those Neanderthals weren't so dumb. Um, so I have O negative blood. I've got the mark of the, uh, mark of the Viking, uh, the trigger finger thing. I've, What's the name of it? It has a syndrome. Yes, uh, Dupertus. Yeah. Um, so I'm definitely a Neanderthal. And, um, but these are great stories. These are fabulous stories. They show what we can do, what humans can do. We're useful. We're a good species. Drop it, kids. Quit chewing on yourself. We got work to do. We're good. We're okay. We're useful. If we learn to behave a little better, it would be better, you know? But there's some... Yeah, the kids really love these stories, right? It's like, okay, good. Yeah, yeah like, I like hearing this. Yeah, this is good. Okay. I'm tired of hearing that. You're shit. Why don't you just die? So, um... <laughs> you know, let's let's go for it. Yeah. So anyway, see see what happens. You ask me a simple question and I, I go off in some other direction. But um, I just wanted to clarify that you were saying that it was the Neanderthals who carried these species north as territory opened up, or did yeah, it it apparently it so. Apparently, yeah. So migration. what we know what we know of the Neanderthal is pretty astounding. They have something called the flower burial. So the caves and the graves that we have found are filled with the pollen and the remains of a of 200 medicinal herbs, 300 medicinal herbs. You know the cave paintings, the you know the understanding. Gary Snyder said the height of human evolution was 40,000 years ago, 30 or 40,000 years ago. It's been downhill since then. And you can tell by the artwork. You, you can tell by the artwork. Oh my God. The artwork was way better in those cave paintings oh than God. anything that has happened since. I mean, just perspective. You know, I'm just throwing some stuff out here. You know, but cool. At least I can cite some sources. That gives me a little cred. Because otherwise, you shouldn't believe anything I say. I'll be, um, yeah, we need multiple sources. We need community. And we need to be ready to learn and to drop some stuff. And, you know, I don't quite understand calling out culture. Um, is there some way we can do calling in culture? Okay, good. Glad to hear it. Um, anybody got some forestry questions? Uh, <laughs> yes. 